Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have a hero conversation I'm very excited to have with me, David Freeman, who is the CEO at CultureWise. And David, he, br- he brought a ton of information back on a previous episode talking about culture and high performance cultures. And I tell you what, I learned so much. So I'm excited to have w- with me my friend, David. David, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic, Chris. It's a pleasure to be with you. Absolutely. So thank you for coming back for sure. I'm, I'm excited just to hear more about your personal story and maybe get us started to just tell us about your journey to what led you to building culture wise to where you're at now. Yeah, it's an interesting story. And, and, you know, Chris, it's funny. It, as I tell this story, it is going to sound as if it was all a big, broad plan because in retrospect, it looks perfectly planned because each step, one step led to the next, right. except it was to me, it felt at least at the time more accidental. So quick version of this. Uh, so I spent, I, I live in the Philadelphia area, Southern New Jersey. And I spent 27 years of my career running an employee benefits consulting company. My father had been in that business uh, really by himself. I worked a couple of summers when I was uh, in college, helping him out, uh, making sales calls when I didn't know how hard that was. When you're naive and you don't know how hard it is, it becomes easy. Um, And so I got out of school on a, I graduated on a Sunday, started on a Monday uh, immediately. It was just my father and I, just the two of us. My father retired a handful of years later, actually went to law school when he retired, which was an interesting retirement. Um, But I grew that company from the two of us to about 110 people. And during the years that I was growing that company, it was a very, very successful company. We were, you know, we made a lot of money. We grew a lot. We were seven or eight times named one of the best places to work in the Philadelphia region. We were five or six times named one of the fastest growing companies. It was a very, very successful company. But I would tell you that virtually all of the success that we had in that company was based upon the culture that we built in the company. It was all about what made us successful. And as the CEO of the company, I just very intuitively did a lot of things to create that culture in a very systematic way. So I eventually, so I did that for 27 years. I eventually sold the company. I never thought I would spend my life in the insurance business. People don't, at least I don't grow up, certainly not many grow up thinking, man, someday if I could get into insurance, that would be my dream. Um, It certainly wasn't mine, but it just happened to be where I found myself. And so I never thought I would spend my whole life being in the insurance business. And I was always way more interested. I I was never interested in insurance. I was always a lot more interested in organizational behavior, leadership. How do you get a group of people to come together and perform in extraordinary ways? I just find that fascinating, whether we're talking about a sports team or any group of people. How do you get that to happen? So I spent way more of my time thinking about that than I did about insurance. I was trying to build a fantastic company. Oh, by the way, it happened to be an insurance and employee benefits. That was almost irrelevant. It was, it was about building a great company. So once I had accomplished what I was interested in accomplishing there, I had the chance to sell the company, sold it. I was still pretty young and, uh, and I was too young to really do nothing. I wasn't going to just sit around and eat bonbons for the rest of my life. And, uh, and I always know I need to be intellectually engaged. And I wasn't sure what was going to come next. I had no plan. And I was okay with that. I knew that 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 I wasn't worried that I was going to become some you know lazy bum. Um, that that's not who I am. So I wasn't worried that was going to become you know my lifestyle. And I just I just relaxed about it and said you know the world will show me where I should go next. I, um, actually, I have a document that I wrote back then. In that it was about a year before between when I left that industry and when I started doing what I'm doing, which I'll tell you about. But there was about a year period in there. And I wrote a a document that I I look at sometimes um, still today that sort of documented what was my state of mind at the time? What was I thinking about? What was my, why did I sell my company when I did? And what were my thoughts about the future? And and my my point of view at the time was, I don't know where I'll go next, but I'm just going to relax about it and let the world show me where I should go. And I will... I'll, I'll, in the meantime, I'll, I'll meet with people and just with no agenda and maybe I'll find something that sounds interesting, but it'll come to me at the right time. And so I also knew that the, the foundation of the work that I had done in my first company around our culture was a, the development of what we call fundamentals, a set of behaviors that we taught in that company that were the hallmark of my leadership career. And I always knew even back then that someday I would write a book about those. And so 
I, I sat down in 2011 and I decided that I, I, I left my old business in 2010. In 2011, I sat down and I thought, you know, I should write this book because I tend to be very forward thinking and not backward thinking. And I realized that if I find a new career to go into, I'll never write that book because I'll, that'll be my old stuff. I'm into the new life. Who, who wants to look back? So I thought I better sit down and write this book now. Otherwise, it'll never get done. Right. So I sat down and I wrote a book about our fundamentals. It was called Fundamentally Different. And, and I wrote that book. I'm always very honest about this. I wrote that book as a closure step, as a way of wrapping up my career in a nice bow. I could put it behind me and I could go do something totally and completely different. It wasn't intended to lead to anything. But people started reading the book and they got a lot of value from it. And I had a former client of my old company who was my benefits company, who was in a Vistage group in Southern New Jersey. For those listeners who don't know, Vistage is a peer group organization. And there are these typically CEOs and senior leaders who get together all over the country in small groups to share best practices with each other. And they bring in speakers. And this person was in one of these Vistage groups. And he said, you know, your book was great. You should come and speak to our Vistage group. And I didn't even know what a Vistage group was at the time, but I got invited to speak to this Vistage group and it was in my own hometown. And I like talking about this stuff. And so I thought, sure, I'll, I'll talk about what I wrote about. And I did. And I was just going to do that one talk. That was it. Just kind of for fun. And what happens in this Vistage community is if you do, do good talks, the word spreads. And I started hearing from Vistage groups around the country asking me, hey, would you come and speak to my group of leaders? And I thought, well, Okay. I mean, I like talking about this. Why not? And one of the first talks I did, a guy came up to me, a CEO came up to me after the talk and he said, that was really interesting what you had to say. Could I hire you to help me do this in my company? And I thought, well, shoot, I'm retired. I don't even know what I would do with the guy, but I'll figure something out. And I did. And here I am, you know, eight or nine years later, and I have now done over 600 of those talks. Actually, yesterday was my 601st of those talks. Uh, I was, where was I? I was in Green Bay yesterday, wow. um, doing my 601st talk. And I have worked with hundreds and hundreds of companies and I've written other books and built a lot of material around it, but none of that was planned. That just sort of happened. One thing led to another, led to another. And, you know, if I look back, I said before, this is, it looks like a plan. If I hadn't created all that in my company, I never would have written the book. If I hadn't, you know, sold the company, I wouldn't have had the freedom to go on to the next thing. Yeah. You know, if I hadn't written the book that led to all of these things, none of this would have happened. When I go out to speak to companies and leaders, I bring a certain level of credibility because I sat in their seat and created all of this. And so they hear me differently yeah. because I was a, I am, was and am a CEO first teaching about what I have done versus a consultant who's never done this before telling them what they should do. So I have a different credibility. So none of that would have taken place had all of these things before that not occurred. So that was a long answer to your question, but um, but it is it's, it's an yeah. interesting story of how this developed, and it was very accidental. I love it, and I love because I tell you for for the listeners out there, I saw five ninety eight firsthand. So you're at, you're at six oh one. I was at five ninety eight. That's how Dave and I got connected, and it, and it was a very impactful speech. Uh, and I am curious because you wrote another book too, culture wise. When did you write that book? Culture by design. So when I wrote Fundamentally Different in 2011, okay. it was never written as a, what I would call a how-to manual. It was mm -hmm. just a book about my fundamentals, the, the things that I did in my company, because they were really important to me. And, and, and I, again, I wrote that book for me, honestly, as much as for anybody else, that as long as I wrote it and I could look at that book and say, you know what, this is really good and I'm proud of what I've created here and it represents my thinking good. If anybody reads it, I don't really care. I mean, it's nice if they do, but I wrote it for me. So, so I wrote that book that way. Many people that started to read that book over the years, read it, loved it, and read it as really kind of like a how to do culture manual, but it wasn't ever written that way. It was just a book about my, my culture and my company. So in 2018, I sat down to write the how to manual. So mm -hmm. this is the, how do you do this book? And that book was called culture by design. And it was everything I teach in my workshops just expanded into more material. So I just tried to take everything I know, everything I learned about how to do this in a company and 
downloaded it out of my brain into a book. And that book is Culture by Design. In 2021, I also wrote an, a second edition of Culture by Design. And so the second, I think that's the, the version you read, Chris, is the second edition. Okay. Um, that book, um, I wrote that book in order to update some of what I'd learned over the last several years between 18 and 2021, but also specifically to address the the new remote and hybrid work environment. Yes, and how yes. do the concepts that I wrote about in 2018, how do those still apply in this new world or do they still apply? What changes, if any, need to be made? So I wanted to address that topic very directly. So I just issued a second edition of that book that I wrote in 2021. And that's that's the version I have. I, now we, I've I've actually been able to interview several authors. I am curious. So, what was the hardest part about writing the book? So, I'm going to be probably. I probably will answer this differently from the other authors. I'm guessing that you've interviewed. So, it was pretty easy for me. Um, okay. One, I'm I'm a writer, so I'm very comfortable writing. That's not a hard thing for me, and not all people are. Secondly, I was writing what I've taught so much. So, when I wrote the first book. And I wrote these, the, you know, these chapters on my original set of fundamentals, as we call them. I was writing things that I talk about all the time. So I just sat down at the computer and I listened in a sense, figuratively, I listened in my brain to, so how do I usually say this? What do I usually say about this topic? Boom, 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 I start typing away. When I wrote Culture, and so that book, I wrote that book in about six weeks. So it didn't take long. That it's is, just, it was all in my head. It's just a matter wow. of sitting down and getting it out of my head onto paper. And so similarly, when I wrote Culture by Design, as I sat down to write, I had already at that point done several hundred of these workshops. It wasn't up to 600 yet, but I'd done hundreds of them. And I just thought, well, what do I say in my workshops when I'm teaching this topic? What do I teach about it? How do I say this? And I just sat down and wrote what I talk about all the time. So I didn't, it didn't require research or anything. Some books take a long time because the author is researching all this material. No, this is what I talk about all the time. I could do this in my sleep. Right. So it was just a matter of, of the discipline to sit down and say, all right, chapter one, let me sit down and talk about this topic. And what do I say about this? And how do I organize it? And just sit down and crank it through. So the second book, if I remember, that took longer. That was closer to 90 days to write that one. Okay. Um, Still, the first one's closer to six days. Yeah. That's so I, you know, I just get it done, and and I I tend to be, I'm pretty impatient, and so when I work on things, I remember this when I was writing fundamentally different. Um, when I wrote that book, I began. There were 30 fundamentals in my company, and so there was a natural structure to. Well, there's going to be 30 chapters at least because there's a chapter on each of these fundamentals. So I sat down and I laid out a schedule and said, all right, if I do, you know, two a week, you know, in 15 weeks, this will be done or whatever. I just kind of mapped it out. And given my normal impatience, once I started writing it, I thought, this is a pretty good book I'm writing. This is actually pretty good stuff. I don't have the patience to wait forever to see this book in print. I want to see this book. This is going to be good. And so I started writing faster and more. And, you know, why do two chapters a week if you could do four chapters a week. And so I just started to pick up the pace. You know, I think about the analogy I think of is when I was little, and I don't know if they still have this anymore. So I'm 60 for our audience's sake. I don't know. I'm not bashful about that. So as listeners are listening, you can picture what age you are and whether this still existed when you were little. But as a, there was a, there was something we used to call paint by numbers. Did you have paint by numbers when you were a kid? We did, and it's, it's still out. Yeah. Is it still out there? Yeah. So yeah. you see, and you, you know, you buy, the, 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 maybe it's got a, you know, a nice canvas and it's got a picture of a horse or something and you, and it's got all the little spots and you color in the, you're painting the numbers based, the color based on the number. And I was really bad at that because you're supposed to let it dry. Like, you know, you don't want the blue to be right. the gray because otherwise they bleed into each other. I don't have the patience to let it dry. I want to see, this is going to look good. I want to see what it looks like when we're done. And so I would like start painting the next thing next to it because this, I want to see the result. Yeah. And so I was that way writing books that, that, you know, when I write a book, I'm, I get excited about what I'm creating. I'm creating something that's really good here that I'm proud of. And I can't wait to see it in its finished form 
Who's got the patience to take a year or two or three to do that? I want to do that now as fast as I can. That's right. So it definitely speaks to your personality. Yes, exactly. So, so, so that's why I write books fast. <laughs> it wasn't hard for me to do. Any thoughts for a, a third version? Maybe, Cause you've worked with so many companies. I didn't know. Are you maybe go back and share um, you know, some wins or things like that? Yeah. I, I don't have anything that's at the moment that's, that's sitting there waiting for me to do. Okay. I mean, if, if I were to do a third book, if, if it, there are probably two books that would come to mind. Um, one is, to your point, there could be a book eventually about the stories that would just be mm -hmm. a storybook. Mm -hmm. Just let me give you each chapter might be another company and tell the story of what they did and, and what they learned and how they applied their fundamentals, et cetera. So that would be an interesting book to read and to write. Mm -hmm. um, the other book that's interesting to me is... It, one of the things I talk about in the beginning of my of culture by design, I talk about this in most of my workshops, is I um, I talk about public high school sports dynasties, and I tell the story in the beginning of culture by design of the women's lacrosse team in my hometown of Moorestown, New Jersey, that for years and years and years dominated in women's lacrosse. They were like, I think in 18 years they won 17 state championships. And as a total side comment about this, this afternoon, I'm literally this afternoon, um, I am hosting a podcast where I'm interviewing the coaches from that team, that women's lacrosse team. Um, but I talk about them in my books and, and I use that in my workshops as an example that public high school sports dynasties are interesting to me because they have two dynamics that make them unusual. The first is that in a public high school, for the most part, you can't recruit. You're mm -hmm. just stuck with whoever lives in your town. Secondly, and so we think in a company, if you had to take anybody who, who wanted to work for you, how hard would it be to be a great company? Secondly, in school environments, you're turning over your roster every year as kids are graduating. So that team that won 17 state championships, those were different players. You know, those were years and years and years of different players. And so again, I, I often say, think in terms of a company, imagine if, if you had to take anybody who wanted to work for you and you turned over most of your people every year. That would be really hard to build a great company, yet that's what public high school sports dynasties do. So what that points out to me is, well, what they've done is they've built cultures of excellence. They've built high-performing cultures that when people come into the culture, they have an elevated expectation and they perform at a different level. So the book that would be interesting for me to write one day is to every every part of the country has those sports dynasties. Any, any listener that's listening to this, I guarantee they could off the top of their head rattle off five or six or seven teams in their area. This school's known for their football team and that's known for tennis and was known for their swimming team or whatever. And everybody's got these experiences. So they're, they're not hard to find. Right. It would be an interesting thing to pick, I don't know, eight or 10 of them and from different sports in all different parts of the country and look for the common denominators. So what did those teams do? that made them so successful and what themes, what can we learn from that? What can we, what can we extract out of those experiences? That would just be a fun and interesting book to do. Well, that would be one I would definitely read for sure. <laughs> it really would be. So I'm curious, you, you talk so much about culture and we have a lot of people listening that are in the industrial sector. They're out there, they're, they're working jobs and we're trying to recruit people to, to bring them into manufacturing in the industry. So speaking to culture specifically, if some, what advice would you give somebody? They they want to they want to you know introduce and come into industry. How could they go about making sure that they're a good fit for the the culture of the company that they're wanting to pursue? You know, is there anything they could do on the front end? Yeah, that's a great question because certainly as you go into a company, your experience of that culture is going to have an enormous impact over whether you feel engaged, whether you like it, whether you enjoy being there, whether it's a a healthy place for you to be. And, and as a, a comment, and I'll get to your question in just a moment, but to make this sort of contextual comment, I, I used to say in my first company that when we had new employees and I would, I always met with on the first day, the first morning of the first day, I spent two hours with every single new employee to talk about our culture, our philosophy, what's important to us, our fundamentals, et cetera. And I used to say to them that I, I would give them a challenge at the end of the, my conversation, I'd say, here's my challenge. When you go home tonight and every day of your career, you should be able to look in the mirror and ask yourself, 
in what ways is our company better because we have you a part of it? And because we need to be. I mean, if we're not a better company with you than we were without you, then there's no reason for you to be here. And, and the ways that you could be better could be related to your job. It could be maybe you're a really funny person and you make a better environment. Maybe you take the time to notice that one of your coworkers didn't look like themselves and you asked them what's going on and they told you about their dad who's ill. And there could be any number of ways in which you contribute, but we have to be a better company today than we were yesterday. But I say, secondly, you should also, this is a two-way street. You should be able to look in the mirror and ask yourself, in what ways am I a better person because I'm a part of this company? Because that has to be true too, that this should be a place that you're growing as a human, that you're that your life is better because you're part of our company, because you're growing, you're learning, you're making connections, you're developing, you know, all the different ways in which you could be a better person. And if that's not happening, then it's not a healthy place for you to be. And, and that doesn't mean you're wrong or we're wrong. It's just not a good fit. Mm -hmm. And so it's a two way street. So given that back to your question, if I'm looking to get into industry and I'm looking at different companies, I want to be thinking about, what are the ways that I might be able to contribute here? And what are the ways that I'm going to be a better person because of my experience of being part of this company? Mm -hmm. So how do you, so I'd be looking through that lens. So how do you do that? Well, some of the things, obviously I would be in an interview. I'd certainly be, uh, I'll talk about before the interview, but in the interview, I'd be asking about, so tell me about your culture. If they can't really define it much, I'm suspicious about how real it is. I would be, and I would push them hard on it. So they say, well, we have a great culture. So what does that mean? How do, how would I know that? You know, what are, what's the evidence of that? How do you practice your culture? If they can't answer those questions, they're probably not that serious about it. If they just point to their core values on the wall, but can't explain, well, how does this live in action? Give me some examples. Mm -hmm. Tell me some stories. It'd be very appropriate to say, tell me some stories about ways in which your, your, your values, your culture came into play in real situations. Tell me a couple of those. Mm -hmm. If they can't come up with any of those, they're probably not that serious about it. Yeah. You might even ask, tell me about some situations in which you, somebody violated the culture and what did you do? Mm -hmm. Tell me about that story. Right. And, and by the way, for anybody who might feel like, well, can I ask those kind of questions? Sure you can. You're trying to find if this is a good fit. I would tell you if I was the interviewer, and you asked me those, I think I love this guy or woman. This is awesome. This is my kind of person. They're, they're the kind of person that I would say that the company that's serious about their culture would love for you to ask them that. That's right. That means you're a good fit. If the company, if you ask questions like that and the company is acting like, well, what are you, who are you asking those kind of questions? Then that's a pretty good indication. It's not a good fit because <laughs> they, they, the right company would value that. Obviously, other things you can do is, you know, you can certainly look at glass door and comments that people make. Right. Always have to take that with a grain of salt because people leaving yeah. have, you know, a certain jaded point of view. But it right. wouldn't hurt to just collect that as data points. I'd certainly want to um, ask, you know, the, the, the person who's interviewing me if I could talk to some others in the company. And I'd try to have some honest conversations with those people and say, what's it like here? Yeah. What's your favorite thing about it? Yeah. And, and by the way. When asking, I'll make this general comment for your audience about anytime you're asking about feedback about something, whether it's in an interview or any other situation, if you're, if you ask for a specific number of things, and I'll show you what I mean in just a moment, you'll get a much more substantive answer. So in other words, if I were, if I were to go to some employee who already works there and I'm thinking about working at this company and I say, so, you know, how, how's the culture here? What do you like about it? I may not get much. If I say, what are the top two things that you love about working here? Mm -hmm. You take that question more seriously. What are mm -hmm. the top two things? Well, I guess it's this and it's this. And you just answer it in a more substantive way. Or what yeah. are two things you wish were different about the culture um, or about the company? Um, two things that are fresh. What are the top two things that frustrate you about being here? Mm -hmm. Okay. You're going to get a more specific answer. If you ask that general, so what's it like? Eh, you don't get anything out of people. Mm -hmm. So those are the kinds of questions I would ask. I love it. It's such great advice for our listeners out there. So definitely lean into that. I am curious, uh, David, before we jump off the, the career track, I, I'd love to know just for you personally, when do you get the most fulfillment? When are you the happiest at the work that you're doing? That's a good question. Um, 
you know, it's interesting. I, I love all the parts of what we do, but I would say the thing I enjoy the most is speaking. Okay. Um, that when I'm in front of an audience doing my thing, you've seen me, um, that's where, that's what I enjoy doing most. And when I'm at home, you know, I, granted that requires a lot of travel. I do about a hundred talks a year. So I spend a lot of time on the road in front of audiences and, and while that is tiring in some ways and the travel certainly can be tiring when I'm home for a week or 10 days and I'm in front of my computer a lot, I think, you know what? I kind of miss being out in front of an audience. I, I, I'm at my best when I'm in front of an audience doing my yeah. thing, teaching. Yeah. I, I'm, I am by nature a teacher. And so my, you've heard me, my speaking style is a teaching style. I like to teach. And when I'm in front of students, whether they be CEOs or others, and I get to teach things. And when I see their eyes light up and I see the light bulb go on and yeah. they all of a sudden see things in a way that they hadn't seen it before. And I think that's what I enjoy most is bringing a level of clarity to a topic that people didn't have before. When people, when you're able to crystallize or distill ideas in a way that makes them more accessible for people so that people, when an audience member says, that makes sense. I never thought about it like that before. Boom. That's the moment that, that that's what I am trying to do is to right. just reframe an idea, a thought in a way that makes it more useful so right. that you can say, got it. That makes sense to me. I never thought about it like that before. Yeah. That's just, yeah. I, I think I have a gift for doing that and that's fun to do. Well, I enjoy that most. I can, per, I can, I can definitely say from first hand experience, that is your superpower. I mean, your, your speaking ability and your teaching. I mean, that was, it just comes out. So I highly recommend listeners. If you get a chance to hear David speak, take advantage of that and move, and move on it. So, uh, we want to get a little bit outside of career and let's talk about sure. things that you enjoy doing for fun. So any, any hobbies that you have, David? Yeah. So a couple, well, before I go there, I'll make this one comment that because I've always been self-employed from my, from the very beginning, I've never worked for anybody else in my life. Um, at least as an adult, um, I've never had much of a separation between work and non-work. Okay. That's by design. Um, so that I, that's not something I resent. I think of, I do life and in the course of life, I go out and I speak and I do other things and I just do my life. So when I look at my list of things to accomplish in a given day on the same list is, you know, go grocery shopping, do laundry and call back this prospect. Um, it's just like, it's just doing yeah. my life. Yeah. And so it's all one. It's not, I got my work life. And then when I stop doing that, then I do my non-work life. So I work seven days a week. But that's what I would want to do. So I don't do that as a, like a, oh my God, I got work to do. I'm just doing my life and this is all part of my life. So having said that, yes, there are hobbies that I do. And so I would say the two that I do most, um, I have been a runner for since I was 13 years old. So 47 years of, of working out every day. And so when I was in high school and college, I competed and for a number of years after as a distance runner, but I've, I've always stayed working out. So I work out every single morning, 365 days a year for 47 years. So I just, it, it's a ritual for me. It's not hard to do. I start every single day with a workout of different types. Given my, my concession to age is that where I used to run twice a day when I was younger, now I run every other day. And on the in-between days, I do some other cardiovascular workout, uh, something in the pool, on an elliptical machine, on a bike, something. But I start every single morning. First thing out of bed is I do a workout every morning. So that's just what I do. Um, I would say I picked up golf when I was in my late 30s. Um, and I love to play golf. And so, you know, where I am in New Jersey, Philadelphia area, we don't have, we don't have a 12-month golf year. Well, some people do play in the winter. I don't. Um, so our official season is from uh, generally April 1st to about November 1st is our okay. season where we're where we're counting scores, et cetera. And so I belong to a club and I, I mean, I will get in, in that period, even as much as I travel, I'll get in 80 to hundred rounds of golf a year. Um, so you know, I play every, every Saturday and Sunday morning. If I, yeah. you know, when I'm home, I'll look at the calendar and say, I got a little block Friday morning. Let me block in some golf so that I don't end up with a phone call at 10 o'clock and one at two o'clock. And then I can't play in the morning or the afternoon. So I try to plan in my golf. So I do. And, and I will say when I play golf, um, 
you know, like everybody, I'm not as good as, as I'd like to be, but I'm competent enough. But when I play golf, my phone is in the locker. Um, I do not bring a phone on the golf course that I see people on a golf course in there answering emails and things. And I think, no, I'm playing golf. This is, this is, um, yes, I do work 24 seven, but when I'm playing golf, I'm playing golf. I'm not there to, to work. I um, mean, maybe I'm the business person, but not usually. I'm just there to have fun. And so the phone is in the locker. I don't even have it with me. It's the one time that I'm out there just enjoying being on a beautiful golf course with some friends, enjoying doing this. And there's nothing better than sometimes on a Saturday or Sunday morning, I like to walk a course. I'm walking the golf course with friends and it's a beautiful day. And I look around and I think, how lucky am I yeah. that I get to be, I mean, people that would die for this opportunity to just be out here on a beautiful day playing golf. That's a pretty good thing. So I would say that's, that's the hobby other than working out every day. And I can totally see that you are working out every day type of person, just with your personality. I guess you got to get some of that energy out when you first get up, right? <laughs> yeah. And just, you know, it's a, it would be weird to me to start a day without a workout. That would yeah. just feel, that's just, and, and I, I forget sometimes that that's not how most of the world works. Like, and I grew up in a family. I have three older brothers. They all ran, um, and live the lifestyle of running. Uh, my wife walks every morning or does a workout every morning. And so in my family, like if, if my whole extended family got together, yeah, most of us would get up in the morning and start our day with a workout. If oh. Some might go for a walk and some might do other things. But I forget that that's not normal. Like in yeah. my family, that's just, that's the way, yeah, don't, doesn't everybody start their day that way? Yeah. That's how we do it. <laughs> Well, that's a great lead in to, the, to the something we love to touch base with our, our heroes about. It's about their family. So what can you share with us about your family? So I grew up in a family of uh, five children. I was number four out of five. Um, it, and so they're all over the place. But my in my immediate family, so I'm married. My wife is Catherine. We met in college. So we got married when I was 22. Um, so a lot of years ago. So going on. This year will be 38 years. Yeah. Um, and uh, we have two children. I have a son, Ben, who is 31. Uh, and Ben is a pastor um, and is of a church, a, a Baptist church outside of Boston uh, in Beverly, Massachusetts. And he has three little ones. So we have three, three grandchildren. And they're five, four, and the youngest will be two next week. Oh, wow. Um, and then I have a daughter, Hannah, and Hannah is 29, soon to be 30 in April. And she is, uh, she got married a year and a half ago and she lives in Williamsburg, Virginia. Oh, um, wow. And, uh, so she went to, uh, she went to William and Mary as did my wife and I both went to William and Mary. Um, and so that's in Williamsburg, Virginia. So, uh, Hannah lives in Williamsburg and she is a third grade teacher, uh, okay. in Williamsburg, uh, no children yet there. I went to Old Dominion, so right across the water there, buddy. There you go. Yep. <laughs> so in my family, I went there, and my daughter and my, I met my wife there, and her family, both her parents were William & Mary grads, and her older brother went to William & Mary and met his wife at William & Mary. So there's a lot of William & Mary in yeah. our family, in our extended family. And that's a beautiful part of the country, too. It's Springs. a great place to be. It's I a great it. place to be. Very good. Well, well, David, we, we do a fun thing when you go ask why and was, we call it the lightning round. I just, I fire off a bunch of random stuff and uh, we just let's, let's people get to know you a little bit better. You willing to play? Sure. All right. All right. I start with the easy ones. So let's, let's go with your favorite food. Favorite food, pizza. Pizza. How about adult beverage? You know, I don't really, I almost never drink uh, and not because I don't. Right. Not, I don't have anything against it, but my favorite beverage, someone asked me, what would you like to drink? Riptide Rush Gatorade. Riptide Rush Gatorade. Now, Gator that I, I'm, I, I love Gatorade. I'd rather have a Gatorade than a beer or a wine. Okay. And if I if, if I had my choice of flavor of Gatorade, Riptide Rush is my favorite flavor. <laughs> is that a red one? It's no. The Riptide Rush is a light purple. Light purple. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Yellow, gotcha. yellow, or, yellow or orange are also good. Okay. Um, but if I had a choice, I would rather have a Gatorade than an alcoholic beverage. Okay. So and Gatorade over Powerade sounds like. Definitely. Yeah. Got it. No, Gatorade, Got it. I mean, if I had to have a Powerade, I would, but Gatorade's definitely better. You know, I've found most people are really aligned with one or the other. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I'm, I'm definitely Gatorade better. <laughs> very good. Very good. What's, uh, what's on your, what's on your nightstand right now? On my nightstand is, um, a book that I had just gotten. Um, I, I do some work with a, a CEO coaching organization called CEO Coaching International. And, um, the, 
founder of that company just wrote a book called Making Big Happen. Um, and so we had just sent it to me. And so it's been on my nightstand the last couple of days. Awesome. Awesome. Very good. Now, what's your, what's your favorite app on your phone? Favorite app on my phone is probably, so I use an app that helps me organize everything I need to accomplish called Opus One. And Opus One. I, I, I'm really organized and staying organized is really important to me. Okay. And it's a great app for staying organized. All right. What's your favorite sports team? Philadelphia Eagles. The Eagles. I'm a season ticket holder too. Okay. Okay. How about all time favorite movie? You know, I was thinking about this recently. You know, it's one of my, I, I don't know if I have a, a, an absolute all time, but certainly among my favorites, um, a few good men. Oh, uh, yes. that's a great movie. TV series. I don't really watch much TV other than sports. Okay. Okay. Now, now I you, like to watch football. Right. Watching football. There you go. How about, how about, uh, any guilty pleasures? Hmm. Guilty pleasures. Hmm. Honestly, none that come to my mind. <laughs> I always say I run for the M and M's, so that yeah. I didn't know if you had well, anything. Well, I, well, I, I mean, if I, I will sometimes eat too many M and M's. So <laughs> yeah, I, I travel. And my kids laugh about this. I travel a lot, and um, so uh, Philadelphia is an American hub for American Airlines, and mm-hmm. so I'm usually on American, and I belong to their Admirals Club, which is their you know airline club, and in there. I can't pass up like free food, which is the silliest thing because like I can afford to buy whatever I want, but it's free. You got to have that. Right. So they, they lately they've been stocking M&Ms and I could eat a whole lot of those M&Ms and like, I'm not even hungry. I don't even need them, but Hey, they're free. Then you got the free M&Ms. You got to have those. That's right. So I will eat a lot of M&Ms when they're there, even if I don't want them. That's and right. then I have a stomach ache. <laughs> Well, what's the, I'm curious for you with the way you've traveled, what's the, the best place you've ever been? Best place I've ever been. You know, I, I, there are certain cities that I like. Um, I mean, there are places I've traveled just like to go. My, yeah. my daughter and I um, went to Colorado. I, I travel a lot with my kids over the years. My daughter and I went to Colorado and did some hiking there. And we went to see a concert at Red Rocks which is a really cool place to, we saw Jackson Brown at Red Rocks, which is really cool. Um, and so sometimes things like that are cool. If I think about my work travel, a city that I like to go to, I like to go to Atlanta. I have a lot of friends in Atlanta. I think it's a cool city. There's a lot going on there. There's a lot of beautiful suburbs. There's a lot of good golf there. Um, weather's usually good. I I like, you know, if I think of, if I get invited to go to a Vistas talk, where do I like to go? I like to go to Atlanta a lot. Okay. Okay. And the, the, the last one, David, dogs or cats? I'm not a cat person. I had dogs growing up, but no, no dogs as an adult. Okay. But I'll, I'll give you one last one that you didn't ask. Okay. Favorite music. Favorite music. Oh, you didn't yeah. Ask music. Me that. Okay. Yeah. I'm a big classic rock and roll fan. Oh. Um, and if I had to pick one artist more than any other, I have, a lot, I have a lot of classic rock artists I love, but I'm a huge Bruce Springsteen fan. Oh. Um, I just think he's amazing. And I just, I love, not only do I love, you know, so much of what he's produced, but he's a guy that also that he's just so authentic. Yeah. Um, he was never into drugs and alcohol. Um, he's, he's just been an amazing performer for so many years. And what I also love that having seen him in concert a number of times, he's a guy that even at, he's about 70 or 71 now, even at this age, he'll do a three and a half or four hour concert with no breaks at this age. And yeah. when you see him on stage, I always say this about him. It's as if it doesn't matter what you paid for the tickets, you get your money's worth Yeah, because he gives everything he's got every single time. And he looks like there's nothing he'd rather do in that moment than be right there. Yeah. That he's just like in his glory with an audience doing his thing Yeah, and loving every moment of it. And that's just, that's fun for the audience to see a performer who's that into it and he's that good. And so I'm just a big admirer of Bruce Springsteen. For sure. Uh, it reminds, for me, that would be uh, Garth. He does it the same thing, yeah. you know, growing up, just seeing, you just feel like he, he leaves it all on the stage. There's nothing left yep. there. So, yeah. Well, I had, had a lot of fun in the lightning round, David. Thank you for participating there. My pleasure. All right. Well, we call it Eco Ask Why, David. We love to wrap up with the why. So if somebody wants to know what your personal why is, how are you going to answer that? That's a good question. And honestly, I don't fully know. So I don't have that in my mind as a, 
clear, crisp, here's what it is. I've always been very introspective. So, you know, I have experiences and I think a lot. I spend a lot of time thinking. I just, I, when I hear people say like, I don't have time to think. I don't have not to think. I'm thinking when I'm putting my shoes on. I'm thinking when I'm in the bathroom. I'm thinking when I'm doing a work. I just think a lot. And so I'm always just trying to notice, well, what are the things that, that resonate most for me or that are most meaningful for me? And presumably at some level, they connect to our why, um, though I haven't crystallized that in a sentence or two. But certainly, you know, we talked about, um, for me, being a teacher is what I enjoy most. And so, you know, if I think about, ideally, all of us are best served and serve the world best when we're making the best use of our gifts and talents. So if I philosophically think we all have some kinds of gifts and talents and, and you know, some might see that from a religious perspective, some might see it from a secular perspective, but in each of us, there's, we have some, some call them superpowers, whatever you want to call them. But there are things that when I think about gifts and talents, I think about things that come easily to you that other people say, how did you do that? Like, I think, I wish I could write music. I don't know how people do that. Like, I can't think of any song I ever think of is one I already heard. So how do you come up with new songs? And yet when you talk to somebody who writes music, they say, I don't know, it just came to me. How did you do that? To me, that's, you know, some people have gifts that are just, they just come to them. They're easy to them and other people marvel at that. So if I think about it from that perspective, what comes easily to me is I have a very organized mind. And so when someone asks a question, I usually can quickly say, well, basically there's three things. It's this, this, this. And I just, I organize ideas and I get to the core of what's the real idea here quickly and easily. It just comes to me. I just see order and structure and it enables me to be able to explain things to people in a way that, as we talked about earlier, that they might not have seen. For everybody else, it was just this fog of ideas and I have an ability to just kind of synthesize it and get right to the core of it and say, no, here's it. Let me explain it this way and have people say, oh my God, that makes sense. So I think that's the biggest gift that I have is that ability. And I think that in the ideal world, the, you know, the, the most wonderful opportunity one can have is to be able to use your gifts and talents in your vocation. Not everybody can. Sometimes they, they do a vocation that is, you know, meets their needs and they use their gifts and talents at home or contributing in some other way. So it doesn't always have to be at work, but if it can, what a bonus. And I feel like I am fortunate that through that accidental story I told you earlier of how I got to what I'm doing now, I feel like I'm, exact, I'm doing exactly what I should be doing, that I'm making the best use of my gifts and talents and contributing to many people and many organizations in significant ways. And it's exactly the best use I can make of what I happen to be talented for. So I don't know how to crystallize that in a sentence, but that's how I think about it. I think it was beautiful because we all had those gifts and talents, but I think you definitely have a, a, a wonderful talent, the way you teach, the way that you lead, uh, the way you inspire. So David, thank you for sharing. I mean, this has been a wonderful conversation. I definitely unpacked a lot here for our listeners. I mean, go to the show notes listeners, check out ways to connect with David and culture wise and all the wonderful things that they're building. And David, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, it's my pleasure, Chris. Great to be with you. Yes, sir. What a fun conversation with David. I'll tell you what, he is a, he definitely is a hero. That guy, what an amazing story. He's led so many different people and helped so many companies just get better. And I love how he said about his why, making the best use of the gifts and talents that we have. Because I tell you what, if you're listening to this, you have a gift, you have a talent, lean into it because that could make the, your, your company, your situation, your family, wherever you're at, that can make that situation so much better. Use those talents, those gifts, and really lean into that. So we're just so thankful for David for what he shared. Check out the show notes on ways to connect with him. Wonderful things there that he's doing, that he's building, and it may be able to help you and your company grow in the future. Now, guys, if you're, if you're like an eco SY, share it with someone. Send a text message. Send an email. Whatever you need to do. Put it on your company intranet. Whatever you need to do. But get it out there. Let people know because we're trying to serve the industry in a different way. It's all about people and ideas over products. So I tell you what, conversations like this, they make an impact. They can be inspiring. They can really show us different paths. Give us a five-star rating. Write a review. All that makes a big difference in, in getting the reach to, to getting the podcast out to more and more people. 
Hope everyone has a great week. And remember, keep asking why.